Right. I will close my screen and my mic, but um, I'll just hang around for a couple of minutes, make sure you're okay. Yeah, no worries. All right, James. Excellent. Thank you. Good luck. Well done. Cheers. <laughs> Hi Oliver, nice to see. You. Nice, nice of you to join. Um, I think we might have a bit of issue with people um, getting in. Well, I've had a couple of issues myself, but oh, well, I hope um, if you have any questions or anything, I'll I'll talk about how to how to direct those to us. But nice of you to join us from Belgium. Hi, Susie in Oxford. Nice, nice here to join us. Um, hopefully, be able to take something from today. We're going to very, very much practical experience. Well, I lay now. Not too, not too far away. Well, Carlisle, sort of north at least. Hi, Nia. Very nice, very nice here to join us. Be nice, be nice to uh, be nice to compare as well because we're, we're as I mentioned, we're quite a few years through in this journey. So be interested to see. Well, hopefully, hopefully can take take something from it and learn from our mistakes. Morning, Ashley, fellow Northerner. Like that, like that. We're getting people joining us steadily, so we'll just um, we'll give it a couple of minutes, and then we'll um, and then and then, then we'll get then we'll get cracking, get cracking. Hopefully, everyone will get something from today. About to hijack my my eldest daughter's bedroom, hence the uh, hence the pictures and the what that what have you behind me. So I uh, can't stay there too long. <laughs> Can't go wrong with a bit of fake ivy, can you?
the the stream of people joining tends to it seems seems to have uh, seems to have stopped. So I don't know whether this is this is it for today or whether uh, whether whether people are having de technical difficulties like I had. So uh, we'll start. We'll um we'll, we'll we'll make we'll make a start. So. In terms of, um, so my, my name's James. Um, I'm head of modern foreign languages at the East Manchester Academy, which unsurprisingly enough is in East Manchester. Um, and I'm gonna to talk today a little bit around how, how we've implemented the, the work of Gianfranco Conte. Um, just a couple of housekeeping, um, one real housekeeping thing for today. Um, should be able to see a Q&A section um, on the on your zoom controls so if you do have any questions at any point please can you direct them there just in case because if they're in the chat then they might get lost in they might know for the market it might get might get lost in where in wherever um and like i say i'll try and i'll try and pause at points during the sessions to answer questions and if not i'm happy to stay on for as long as anybody needs um in order to answer any, any questions that you might have um so just to start us off then with a little bit of context, because I think context is massively, massively, massively important. Um, so this, the school where I work is, is called the East Manchester Academy. It's about a couple of miles outside the outside the city centre. Um, it's situated in a basic area of the city, which is ranked in the top 1% for deprivation disease. And in terms of the, uh, the cohort that we have at the academy, we serve a wide range of um, a very diverse community. Um, apparently, we are number six in the country in terms of pupil premium numbers, and we have the most, the highest number of pupil premium students um, in in Manchester. The last count was around seventy six, but seventy six percent. But given given the current economic climate, you know, we, we, we could well see that rise. In terms of, um, we have around 40, 42 percent EAL, and almost a quarter of our students um, are. Uh, categorised as SENB. Um, in terms of, if you were to read our Ofsted report, it is very much out of date. Um, we're, we're currently in special measures and the Ofsted report is, is grim reading, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, if I'm honest, I just want the call now because I want them to come and I want them to see the change and I want them to see how how, how far we've come and to, and to get us out of special measures because um, we are not at school anymore. Um, just a little bit more NFL specific. Um, in terms of um, in, in terms in terms of the results from last year, there are a massive improvement for the school. But um, in terms of NFL, our average grade was about a grade higher than the school average, and the school average was a massive improvement on that too. Um, with regards to languages, we Spanish is the only language that we teach at, at our school, um, partially because we only have two hours a week at Key Stage Three. So I would my rationale for that is I'd rather develop expertise in one language as opposed to trying to do half a job with two. Um, languages are not compulsory at the moment, um, but options numbers are on the rise. Um, current year 11, we have about 45. In the year 10s, we have nearly 100. And this is, I believe, in massive part due to the changes that we've made and the adaptation of our Conte EPI inspired, inspired curriculum. Um, in term, and in terms of our department, we're quite a young team. And there's myself, I have two now second year ECTs and then another member of staff who's in their fourth year of teaching. Um, just a little bit about, about me, because you're probably thinking, well, who's this guy and what's what, what his credentials? So as I said, I'm, I'm the head of languages at TEMA. Um, I've, I'm an ECT mentor, I've been a speaking examiner, I've delivered CPD both whole school and also internationally now. Um, so if anyone wants any CPD uh, delivery, Give me a give me a shout on Twitter and I'm happy to plan anything for you. Um, we've also been supporting a number of schools across Greater Manchester with their implementation of EPI. So we've had a number of visitors. So if you're within travelling distance of Manchester, we are more than happy for you to come in and to see some lessons and to see in in, in practice how we do things. Um, and also with the last academic year, I completed my MA in expert teaching, which was run by Ambition Institute. So the reason why I mentioned that is because pretty much everything that I talk about today is going to be heavily informed by research. So it's not just something which works in theory, We're talking about things which work in practice too. Now, for those of you, for those of you who've, who've, who've read a lot around EPI and read a lot around in terms of content methods, will recognize this straight away. For those of you 
who are maybe new, um, I, I highly recommend the Breaking the Sound Barrier book. I, if anything, probably the courses are the best one. We've been on quite a few, we've hosted him a few times. You, you're just leaving your life has absolutely changed in terms of how you look at language teaching. Um, I was fortunate enough, we were fortunate to host him and to host the course by Gianfranco last year. And I talked him through our model and he said, well, it's good, isn't it? But it's not really Mars is, at which point I was thinking, God, you're taking the mickey, pal. Um, but I, I, my, my counter to that would be, is, is no, the approach I'm going to show you today does not go in order in terms of now we do this, now we move on to awareness raising, now it's just that's a process, now it's structured. We don't follow it like it's prescriptively like that, but I would argue that we hit all the elements of that, but we've done it in a way which we've done it in a way which is best for best for the students that we teach. And at the end of the day, with any sort of research or any sort of with 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 in in terms of anything that you look at, you know that what you hear from another school or, or or in terms of like I say, with in terms of any evidence, you've got to do what works for you. You and, you've, and you and you can't just take things off the shelf. You need to tweak it and adapt it for the for the benefit of learners sat in front of you. So in terms of why do we use chunks then? So there are absolute there's chunks and sentences. Well, there are clear links here to cognitive load theory in terms of in terms of how the brain is formed. The brain can only store four items. Um, the brain can only store four items at a time. So these items could be four words. These items could be more four phrases. And the higher the uh, the higher the element interactivity, the higher the intrinsic load. So the more elements the working memory has to contend with the high the high the cognitive load and therefore the higher the risk of cognitive overload and understanding the syntax understanding the rules of syntax there are lots of elements that play there especially in especially in a, especially in a modern foreign language whereas understanding the word there are not as many elements so therefore we're trying to reduce the intrinsic load straight straight from the straight from the beginning because let's face it, the students that we teach, they're, they're not the, you know, they're, they're, they're novices and novices, novices do, um, novice, novices do benefit more from, from being given a words example. So when we're given a sentence builder, the chunks and the, the chunks are in, are, are already given in context. And in, in, and in terms of the sentence builders are a perfect work, works example. So by presenting the language in that manner, what we're doing is we're minimizing we're minimizing the amount of the amount the amount of elements that the amount of elements that the students have to the students have to contend with. So, in terms of what do our sentence builders then look like? So, uh, as I've just mentioned, the sentence build a sentence builder is a worked example, um, and and our and, and if I'm honest, our our sentence builders have have, 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 have undergone quite a transformation. At first, they're incredibly overcrowded. I would probably say this is about as much as I would put on a sentence builder. Um, and and partially part of the reason why this is is because th this is the second actually the second sentence builder that, that we that, that we teach for that we teach year eight in term one. And the majority of this they have seen on the first one. So it's building, it's it's, it's building. Building upon their building upon their prior knowledge, um, all the target language is in bold. The English is next to it in in brackets. If you look on the past opinion bit, you've also got the like the, the dodgy English to kind of to try and highlight the difference between between the between the patterns in, in the target language and and also in Spanish. And also you've got a, as much spacing as you possibly can, just to try and reduce the amount of you know in order in order to ensure that attention is directed to where. To where you want them to direct it to, and um, you'll also notice along the top where it says knowledge and concepts. Um, at our school, there's a bit, there's been a big push in terms of defining what do we mean by knowledge and what do we mean by concepts. Now, in terms of knowledge, you could go down an absolute rabbit hole, but to make it the most student friendly that we can, in terms of when we give this to the students, the knowledge is the vocabulary. These are the words that you're learning, and the concepts are the grammar. And these are the feet in terms of the concept. These are the threads that are going to run through your curriculum constant that, that are going to run through constantly. So by having them at the top, we're trying to encourage, we're trying to expose the students and encourage the students to, to use and to understand that, that meta language. So how do you choose the chunks then? So choosing the chunks, how do you choose the chunks? Where do you start? Because as, as I mentioned just before, just because, well, as everybody was signing in, 
we're quite a few years into this journey now. And if, if you're right at the beginning, it can seem like quite a daunting task. Now, I know Gianfranco, um, Gianfranco advocates the use of his communicative, you know, communicative functions. I know with regards to the Ofsted Languages Research Review, I know it's been widely criticised in some areas, but you know, if, 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 you know, if, 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 if you're constantly living under the spectre of Ofsted, you kind of need to, you know, you, you do you do need to have one eye. You do need to have one eye on that. There's also the um, program of study. Now we the for, with regards to the national curriculum, we, we had the we had a monitoring visit last November, and we were chosen we were chosen for a deep dive. The inspector was not an MFL specialist, but he was obsessed. Despite the fact we're in academy, he was obsessed with the national curriculum. So it is worth bearing in mind. And there is a link there that I've put a reminder on myself to put that in the chat to you. Yeah? It's not language, it's, it's not actually language specific, but um, Fabi talks about in terms of portable knowledge. So what is the essential knowledge that you can transfer? So this, so, so this is kind of where we need to zoom out to look at not just the curriculum in terms of a unit or a year group, but as a whole key stage and, and, and how does that, and, and how does that all fit? How does that all fit together? So I'll just put that in the link in the chat now so you can have a look at that later on. Because I found that something really useful when we're when we've been designing, when, when we've been designing our curriculum. Um so let's move on. So in terms of how how we built our curriculum then. So we did, I mean, to be honest, in, initially we did start with the, the Conte communicative functions, we started with those and then some of them we've adapted and some of them we've changed and some of them we've, we thought, you know what, it's, that doesn't suit the needs of our students. But kind of where we've evolved towards is, 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 is this idea, this mnemonic avocado. Now I know there's loads of other ones out there in terms of like Quacknote and whatnot, but at the end of the day, when we were designing our key stage three curriculum, we kind of had the brief of saying, right, if the spec changes next year, and you know, we all know if well, if you've seen the draft spec, we're kind of I think well, you know, I'm I'm quite confident we're going along the right lines anyway. But if the spec were to change every year, you know, it doesn't matter what are the things that students are going to need to know at the end of key stage three. Well, they're going to need to know adjectives, they're going to need to know verbs and a range of tenses and a range of um a range of verb subjects, they're going to need opinions and reasons and connectives and adverbs and to speak in detail. And then have them little MG phrases, the little cherry on the cake. They're always going to be able to. They're always. They're always going to have to have have to use have to use that language. Um, oh, sorry, I've just seen that. Let me just see. Aha, there we go. Let me try that link again. There you go. Hopefully that's right. Thank you for uh, thank you for drawing that to my attention. Um, so as I say, in, in terms of when you're designing the curriculum, because we know, as, as we know, the current eights will sit the new GCSE, but you know, uh, like, you know that 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 <laughs> that doesn't mean that there isn't going to be another spec change in however many years. So it's just trying to, in terms of future proofing your curriculum, and think by the end of year nine, where do I want my where where do I want my kids to get up to? So for us, we broke it down like this in terms of all roads do lead back to avocado. And at key stage four, this is this is a lot more it's a lot more explicit. But at key stage three, the idea is to build sequentially over time. So in year seven, the students know that year seven is the year of the present tense. Now the aim, of, like I said, is then year eight builds on that. The year of the past, we put them together. In year nine is the year of the future. They put all three together. Gone are the days for us, at least. Gone are the days of thinking. Right. Well, I need to teach a. Um, you know, I need to teach so many set phrases because they need to hit all tenses in year seven to get to a level four or to get to a level five. It's not about that for us. If, if by the end of year seven, the students, can, the students know the present tense, can use the present tense and have got a strong foundation in the present tense, I am happy. I am not bothered about tenses in year seven. If they can get the basics in terms of, like I said, the present sense, then in year eight, we can build upon that with the past sense because there's already a bit of prior knowledge and already a bit of understanding around, around how verbs work in, in, in the target language. Then in year nine, we'll have the future and we'll also look about how we use them all, all together. Um, so that's kind of how, how, that's kind of how, how our curriculum works. Um, in, any, in, a, in, a lot of, in a lot of Jean Franco's um, um, blogs and whatnot, you'll see he talks about his universals around his non-negotiables. Um, 
Sorry, I just saw the chat. Oh, thank you. Um, um, so um, talks a lot about his non-negotiables. Non um, so for us, year eight, this is an example of the same year eight sentence builder I showed you before. And this the, this is one of the first sentence builders that, that, that we'll teach a sequence of learning with. But then after that, after our do now task, silent starter, whatever you call it at your school, um, this is a task, it, This we we do something around this, so whether it's speaking, whether it's listening, whether it's translation, whether it's whatever. And it's a really, 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 really good chance just to kind of to, to reinforce with the students like kind of the narrative that are learning. What is year eight of? And year eight will be able to tell me, right, year eight is the year of the past tense because that's kind of the next step that we're looking for at school. It's, it's all well and good was designing this curriculum and us as teachers knowing this curriculum but kind of we want, want students to be able to articulate the learning more um, and what's really nice with this as well um, is, 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 is last year in particular with year sevens all, all of year seven were able to tell me oh so well you know we repeat it again and again because we want it to go into our long-term memory you know and if you know if we can get students understanding the learning process and get students speaking like that well then that's a massive 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 win um, so in terms of what our long term, term plan looks like so as I talked about before kind of thinking about where do you pick your vocabulary this is a, an example of our long uh, curriculum map um, I know each school will have its own certain pro forma for this and this kind of fits ours but I've added columns because it's you know, I've, I've added columns of what's important to us but the main thing here is, is, is about, is about the, the change we've made in terms of coverage as well um, prior to pr prior to developing uh, an EPI curriculum, um, our curriculum was a mile wide. We would cover so much content, but it was an inch deep. Like you know, you you, you would you try and revisit something, or you'd ask students about something, and they'd have no idea what's going on. The best example I've got this was Ofsted, maybe 2017, 18, some way, 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 way back when. We taught the students in the near future tense, like, oh, it's great, it's fantastic. Look how far they've gone in that hour. Next lesson, kids have no idea. So it's all well and good saying we cover X amount of ground, but actually you want to take the time to, to you do. The, the aim and the change is really we want to go away from performance and we want to go away from actual durable learning and converting that knowledge in, into the, into the long-term memory. So what we do is we do three core questions per term, and each one of those will be around six, seven, six or seven lessons. Again, depending on your context, depending on your students, you may go the same speed as us. You may just copy and paste what we do. You may go faster. You may, every single thing you do needs to be with those students in front of you in, in, in mind. Um, so just, um, just a little bit around sort of the pitfalls, to be honest with you, to, um, before, um, before I move into kind of showing you our model now, because I'm not, I, I'm, I am absolutely not going to sit here and say we're incredible and we've got everything right first time. It has taken time to get to where we are right now. So when we the 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 very our very first um, sort of our, 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 our very first attempts at implementing ET at EPI came after we we're actually lucky enough to host um, Jean Franco many many years ago, and this. The, this on your screen is, is kind of how we took it. So we went very, very literal. We were like, right, modeling. We're going to have one lesson of phonics, then one lesson of meaning, one lesson of flooded input, and then into writing. And it it was kind of criminal, really, that the students didn't produce any language. Well, that, that's what we felt in reflection, is that students didn't produce any writing until lesson four. But also, also, it was ridiculously robotic. You knew exactly what every single student was going to write. There was no flair, no creativity. Um, within the with, within the students' writing, and also in addition to that, when we got towards lesson six, fell off a cliff because the students had the sentence builders all the way up until all the way up until lesson five. There was no chance for any sort of practice, any sort of practice without. Um, looks like there's a question in the chat. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it does start with experimentation and the cycle that I'm going to show you in a moment around. Um, like I said, it's kind of developed into a seven lesson cycle now. Um, it's, re it's, it's really handy teaching that same cycle across the key stage because every seven lessons, there's a chance to pause and reflect and think, right, what's working, what's not. And even the cycle I'm going to show you at the moment, you know, if I was to do this talk again next year, 
I'd hope it'd be different. I'd hope it, I, I hope we would have changed it. Actually, we will have changed it. And also this cycle looks different to how we started in September, even though what we're, we're, we're only in the second half term. So it's about constantly pausing and reflecting what's working, what's not working, how can I change it and how can I, and how can I adapt it? Um, so as I say, why, why, why the change? We wanted students to be more creative with the language. There's nothing, there, there are very few better feelings in a classroom when you, you're looking at students' work and they can surprise you. They've, they've gotten some phrase from wherever, from, from, from wherever they've got it and, and, they throw, and, and they throw something in. Whereas in our original interpretation, it wasn't like that. You knew what every single student was going to write. And also about how do we, how, how do we shift the way the reliance on it? How, how do we shift the way the reliance on the sentence builder? So this is the this is what we're working with at the moment. Now, some of it is very much embedded, and some of it is it it it, it, it absolutely is a work in progress. Um, so we'll start off on lesson on lesson one to so lesson six, and then lesson seven is where the biggest is it is where we're still fine tuning, but I'm 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 happy that we're going in the right direction. Um, so just before I do begin, though, um, because as I say, like in terms of my makeup of my team, so there's, there's myself, I've got two second year ECTs and I've got another member of staff who's looking at like fourth, fifth year of teaching. Um, and in terms of the understanding of sort of the, the around EPI and around content in terms of, you know, in, in terms of my pedagogical subject knowledge is stronger than the rest of the team. So when you're thinking about designing a curriculum, I think I've said it now a couple of times. Oh, can I go back? Of course I can. There we go. Um, so this, as, as I say, this, this what's on the, on that, that you can see on your screens at the moment is, 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 is how we will teach one sentence builder. So for each, each term, we have what we call a core one, which we will, we will go through the process of these seven lessons with. And then we have other ones which I'll I'll talk about as we as we as as well as we go through. Um, so just going back to to, to what you can to, to what you can see now. Um, I think I've mentioned a couple of times about it being really important to to design your lessons and to design your curriculum with your students in mind. But you've also got to think about your staff, right? If 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 you've got a team of baby teachers or if you've got a team of and you know. In, in terms of even more experienced staff, but they don't know this process, then you need to make sure that you support them. So what I've done is, so what you can see on here is, it, I, to be fair, I, I know it's not the clearest, but I'm gonna go through this in a bit more detail. But the point I'm trying to make is, we've got those seven lessons, and then within those seven lessons, I plan the sequence of each one of those lessons. So all my staff need to do is the bit in yellow is to think, right, we're gonna do a task in terms of, it's flooded input around listening, right? That's where that's going to fit into the into my lesson. Oh, it's lesson one. We're going to look at the form of the word, right? That's where that's going to go. Oh, we're going to do a bit of structured output with support. That's where it's going to go. So, if anything, what 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 this works as is is a worked example for those more novice members of staff. And in terms of that word novice, that doesn't just mean a PGC student or someone who's in the first year or the second year. That could be someone who's been teaching fifteen years but been teaching a certain way 15 years and doesn't necessarily have the same sort of expertise around teaching in this te te around teaching in this manner but also also what this also what this does produce is equity across every single classroom i know if i walk into another classroom regardless of the member of staff regardless of experience or or, or whatever i know all the kids are getting all the kids are getting a good deal. All the kids are getting the same, relatively the same, relatively the same deal. I will just caveat that with one thing though. This doesn't mean that we all teach out of the box. Now, I have in 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 in, in one year group, I've got a very very high ability class, and in and in that very same year group, I have a class with a lot of need in terms of there are four or five students in there with an AHCP. And lots and every single student in that class is on the SEND register. So in terms of my aim is that all those students will go to the same endpoint, but I'm probably gonna I will be putting more scaffolding in place and more support in place for the students 
who need it as opposed to the students who don't. Right, I've got a question. Let's have a look. Um, just wondering if you got rid of all the textbook um, in, key, in key stage three. Um, yes, yes, we have. Um, we, we, we do not use textbooks at all in key stage three. Every single thing we do is, is it, it's all bespoke. It is all bespoke to, um, to, to, to the needs of our curriculum. Because like say in year seven, we want the present sense. In year eight, we want the past. But still building on the, still looking at present sense and how those two can go together. And then in year nine, we look at in term, in terms of the future. I mean, I know I mentioned, I know I, I know I mentioned before around um mentioned before about all the sort of all the different influences. So around Conti's own influences, around the Ofsted, the national curriculum, and um, a shared link as well. Um, but I mean, of course you can look in the textbook to, you know, you know, you know, you know, to help you design. Um what else have we got? Um, I hope that's answered the question. If it hasn't, then please, please, please find more questions at me. Um, so in terms of, I'll just answer this one about assessment. Um, I'll just answer this one about assessment and then I'll come back to the other questions if, if, if that's okay. Because um, this assessment question, this assessment, I've just sort of been asked, what about assessments? Is it really time consuming to make them? So like with this medium term plan, I've got a model in terms of how I want the lessons to be sequenced, within that, I will I will give them a PowerPoint in terms of this is how the lessons will look, and and then the team. So I've got I plan key stage four, and I've got the three other members of staff all take a year group each following that. In terms of assessment, how how we do that is we agree again on a template of how we want it to look. So thinking around the idea of um, transfer appropriate processing, so that, that 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 in terms of the assessment does look like what they have done in class. There is a link there that, um, that there is a link there. So in to, um, because what we don't want is we want an assessment to show us what the kids know. We don't want an assessment to throw up barriers. So what we will do there is agree on a template, and then each member of staff goes away go goes away and plans it. Um, I think if you look far enough in advance and you can plan it far enough in advance, sharing that workload does not make, and sharing that lot workload and sharing that vision in terms of what the assessment is going to look like with a, with a, um, with a template at first, that does actually reduce, that does actually reduce the workload. Um, thank you for that. That's great. Um, with the other two, if you don't mind, I'm going to, I'm going to crack on and I'll, I will, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to those later. Um, so in terms of what what it actually looks like then so um with regards to lesson one we begin with the building blocks of the language so we look at the focus is on the form of the words and the meaning of the words so we look in terms of form in terms of how we form the words in writing and speaking how they are formed when we're trying to understand them when we're listening and and like say in terms of the spelling for that receptive knowledge too um so here there is tons and tons and tons of work on on phonics and, and what is the relationship between the written word and the spoken word now we do not stop teaching phonics we teach phonics all the way through the first sentence but the first lesson of every sentence builder is phonics phonics heavy now in terms of you know the the other departments can hear us they 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 know for a fact when we're doing a phonics lesson because they can hear us booming down the, they can hear us booming down the corridor um and you know i think the impact of this is that been that students pronunciation has improved so with one eye on i mean i know at the moment we've seen draft specs of the for, for the for the new exams but in terms of reading aloud i've got no issue whatsoever and i'm not going to change what i'm doing with to, to suit that that because my kids are going to be ready for that anyway um, and so the students pronunciation has has come on loads the students are more confident now when if i'm asking them to read aloud or 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 to speak aloud when that hasn't always been the case um because the students understand now they 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 the, the students understand how to pronounce the words the students understand the difference between how we write a word and how we say we say a word and that confidence has just increased absolutely massively um and part of the reason and in terms of meaning at this stage it's purely chunk based so if a goal so i, I know this has a different title and i'll, I'll talk about it in a minute so it was to use this one as an example i wouldn't be asking students to translate sentences at this point absolutely not 
I just want them to know what the chunks mean. Can they tell me what Burke Fue means? If you can, great. That, that's what I want. It's lesson one of, of seven. You know, it can at the end of the, at the end of this lesson, can you tell me what most of these mean or, or my most important ones, what my most important ones mean? Can they spell them? Can they say them? And if they can do that at lesson one, absolutely, absolutely happy days. Um, with regards to another thing that we've started to introduce this year, and 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 as I said before, again, it's about adapting any sort of approach to suit um any sort of approach to suit your students. We ask the kids what they want to know. So there we've got some ideas of nouns for places in town. We ask the kids what they want to know. We'll write some ideas on the board and they write it in the book. We've got them all printed out for the entire year. But you know, if you're if 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 if, if you're at a stage where you're still developing your sentence builders, you can ask them before you teach them and then print that out with with, with it in there. Um, in terms of all our lessons start with a retrieval quiz. Now, this is partly a whole school initiative. Um, but what in terms of the reason why I'm bringing it up now is, is, is in terms of the knowledge that in terms of the knowledge that we select for it. So um, the re, it also says knowledge organizers on there. That's what we call them again, linking into the whole school thing. They are sentence builders. There's no doubt about that. But the kids are used to using the word knowledge organizer. So that's why we use that word for the, for the children. But um, as you can see on this one, the first three are just chunks that they've seen in the past. We could do sentences here. Again, it depends on your students. It depends where you're at. But the last three where we're looking at transfer. So what have the students seen before and what they're going to need today? So it might be in a listening task. It might be in a speaking task. It might be in a writing task. What language have they seen before that they're going to need to take from what they've done previously in, 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 well, into today? And then what we do is we... Um, in terms of varying the support, first they have a go by themselves with no help, and then we get a purple pen out and we redraft. And which so so that first task is retrieval because they're not just looking in a sentence builder and picking it out. They are actually having to, you know, think effortfully in order in order to try and retrieve the answer. But they've got that support of the knowledge organizer of the knowledge organizer afterwards. Um, then there are a lot, I mean, there are absolutely millions and millions of tasks that like, you know, I've just picked out a couple that I could fit on one slide. Um, but in that first lesson, it's about the form versus meaning. So you listen and repeat, however you do that, you are focusing on the form of the word, you spoke, you're spoke. focusing on the spoken form of the word, you faulty echo, again, you're focusing on how the words are formed with sound. Even something like chunk bingo, you're listening, you're listening to the word and you're focusing on the form of the word. Nothing to do with meaning with, with, with this task. Same with missing letters, nothing to do with meaning. Correcting the errors, again, it's about the form of the word. So in this lesson, we will it just need to be really, really clear in terms of what is the purpose. Are you focusing on the form or are you focusing on the meaning? And to be honest, anything to do with meaning is... Do you know what it means in English? Can you translate the chunks? However you however you flower that up in terms of if it's a matchup or just, you know, one pen, one die, or just sit down, shut up and translate, anything to do with translating into English, that's where you're focusing on meaning. Um, then we move on to lesson two with regards to um, um, with flooded input. Now, what we've, what we've started to do is we've mixed together that receptive processing and the structured output in the same lesson because previously they didn't write to lesson four and we want to bring that in a little bit earlier and um, now because we are a few lessons that because we are a few years down the road we've got quite we've got quite a big bank of sentence builders that we don't consider core ones so the students have access to them we call them stretch sentence builders and um, so that gives the students a chance to explore the language and to use and, and well, to stretch themselves to push to to you know to push them Sells a little bit for. Um, so, what does flooded input mean? I hope, I think I've put that on the next slide. There we go. Um, thank you, Susie. Perfect timing. Um, so, what do we mean by flooded input? Is about these are listening and reading tasks which force the students to, 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 to process the same patterns again and again and again and again. So, you look at the narrow, re the narrow reading task on there, every single one is time phrase, verb, country, fui, con, whoever then in terms of you've got transport, then an opinion, then someone else's opinion. It's just about those same patterns again and again and again and again and again. And the idea is that you flood them with loads of input before they push that as output for speaking for speaking and writing. So in, in, in essence as well, you, you, what in essence what you're doing here is you're giving the students models of, of 
you can just use models of, of, of what you want them to produce in uh, produce in the end. The um, I should be asking him for some commission here, but his book, Breaking the Sound Barrier, is brilliant. It's got loads and loads and loads and, and loads of um, loads of ideas around this. Um, then lesson three for us, really, really similar. We will do more listening and reading, but this is where our awareness raising comes in. And we're going to start looking at how we unpick the grammar. Um, so the big difference, well, how, how, we, how we do it is because grammar is an abstract concept and in terms of research around teaching abstract concepts, it says around you should teach concrete example first before, before teaching the abstract. So we teach the concrete vocabulary. Do they know what we means? Do they know what middle store means? Do they know the adjectives? And then we can chuck on top that abstract concept of grammar um, around adjectival agreement or preterite sense or, 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 or whatever it may be. Um, so with, with with regards to this, what um, because I, yeah, with with regards to this, it's it's more of a blended approach of implicit and explicit teaching. It's like in terms of um, concrete fading, fading, because the concrete, the vocabulary is the concrete, the grammar is the abstract. Um, but in terms of a lot of the research around concreteness fading is is around is around maths and around science and how how those concrete examples are faded out. Whereas actually this is the difference with this approach in an MFL, whereas the concrete vocabulary is never going to be faded out as opposed to the grammar, the abstract is, is, is actually being faded in. So how do we do this? It's, it's about linking it to prior knowledge. As, as William says, we interpret everything in terms of what we already know. So the majority of the students that we teach, native, their native language is going to be English. Their English is going to be better than their Spanish. Their understanding of grammar in English is going to be better than in Spanish. So we link it to that. And with, with regards to this, so I don't want the student, well, you know, at first you're going to go, oh, it's the other way around. But then we want to try and push the students beyond that with that use of that meta language and the meta language that you can see at the bottom, that will be on the sentence builder as well. Um, and then then how we assess that, um, formatively assess that is, is for a hint, we use a hinge question to get a data-driven decision straight away in terms of, are they ready to move on or not? Can we move on or do I need to put on the brakes and do I need to teach? Do I need to reteach? They've had this before where um, they've had this before where students aren't sure about the past tense in English. So we need to put on the brakes and we need to get that right first before I can even think about trying to teach, um, before I can even think about trying to teach the um the 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 past the past tense in, in Spanish. Um and in terms of like how this hinge question looks. Um, there's loads of Dylan Williams written absolute loads and loads and loads around around hinge questions but the idea is really it's, it, it's to kind of what what we're trying to do here is to try to get feedback from the whole class and we it's just a quick check of understanding and the way you design these is to think of your misconceptions so I'm looking here about adjectival yeah adjectival agreement or in terms of the, the word order um and and, and, and the idea is to try and think each one of these answers deliberately leads me in, in, into a misconception. So if they've answered A, they're thinking this. If they've answered B, they're thinking that. If they've answered C, they're thinking whatever. Um, so the idea is you can't get it right for the wrong reasons. Um, I'll just pause because there's a couple of things coming in there. Oh, thank you, thank you. Oh, there we go. There's the link in terms of breaking the sound barrier. Um, right, in terms of, um, so expansion. So this is where, our interleaving comes in. Um, in 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 a language teacher tool, toolkit, a lot of the early stuff he writes, the, he explicitly mentions interleaving at this stage. Um, now, in terms of in terms of how it works for us, this is where we're linking the old to the new. So we've initially blocked the language. So the first four three lessons, it's the same vocab, it's the same vocab again and again and again and again and again. But this is now where we're going to start changing it. And um, the reason why we don't interleave straight from the off. Um, Pan et al. in 2019, there's two studies, and they talked about how a block to interleave schedule of teaching may be beneficial for certain elements of language learning. And we've certainly found this um, with, with looking at this. Um, but what we've done as well, and again, this was only last year when we did it, not in the first couple of years, is where we've created actual a sentence builder. Um, we've created a, a an expansion sentence builder. So if this is going to work for me. There we go. Um, so we've play, created a, an expansion sentence builder. And part of the reason why we've done that is again, going back into the literature 
um, Carpenter and Muller in um, 2013 talk about discriminative contrast, and that's what really so that that's what really helps with interleaving. So this is an example of year eight. These past tense verbs in red are all exactly the same as what's been seen in year seven, but in the present. So being able, to, so in terms of that discriminative contrast, it is very easy for students to confuse in terms of, you know, jugué and juego, very, very easy. So that's where interleaving works best, where you've got two different ideas, which have, which are, which are, which are, which are easily, easily confused. Um, then lesson five, um, I'm just aware of the time, so I'm, I'm starting to motor a bit. And this has been the game changer in terms of us, because we had the first four lessons in the original interpretation where, then they fell off a cliff and they couldn't use it. They couldn't do anything about the sentence builder. So what we've done now is they, they, this is the part of the lesson where, hence the bike, is where we stay to them, right, we're going to start to take the stabilizers off a little bit now and use the analogy of riding a bike. The first four lessons, you've got the state stabilizers on, you, you've got the sentence builder. Now we're going to take it off and we're going to start to see what we can do by our, start to see, see what we're going to do by ourselves. And um, as you know, and, and, and this is an example here where, of, of where we're starting to fade the scaffolding because we're gradually adapting the teaching um, in order to in, in order to suit the growing expertise of the learner. Um, and this is what it looks like in practice. So um, we call it sin ayuda con ayuda. Um, so we'll say, right, you've got five minutes, crack on. What can you do by yourself? And then we go back and we redraft and we edit. Um, and so again, so it's, it's so, so so kind of what we're doing here as well is we're trying to promote those um, metacognitive strategies in terms of with, with that you know in terms of planning, monitoring, and evaluating. It's that monitoring and evaluating that we're looking at here in terms of you've you've written a piece of work. What are you happy with? What are you keeping? How how are you then going to adapt it? And how are you going to change it? And the last lesson in the, well, sorry, the the original last lesson before we added on lesson seven um, is is this is now where we're starting to take the stabilizers off. So this begins where, where we look at um, a waggle and part of the reason why well, what we've done is to, to kind of to, to link in the whole school um, quizzes, how they want the format, is we've put it in English and they put it into Spanish because that's how the process is going to work when they're writing. They're going to formulate their ideas in English and they're going to want to put them into Spanish. So it's linking that in, into there. Um, and, then, and then what we do is we, we, we then revisit some of the salient grammar points from lesson three, but without support. So in lesson three, you could quite easily argue our hinge question is performance because it is straight away after an exposition. Whereas here, I am looking at learning. I am looking at, you know, at this uh, um, at this stage in the game, I am looking at learning because there is absolutely no so there's there is um, there's no support for the learner. Um, and then towards the end, the students go and they try and they and they produce something by themselves, which they've been peer assessed or assessed by myself. Um, how, how our hinge questions look at this stage is we'll give the students um, three hinge questions with the three main grammar points, and then we want them to um, explain why. And they do those first two columns all by themselves. Um, and then afterwards, immediately, there is a feedback task. Um, there is a feedback task on there, um, on there too. Um, and then with the feedback task, if they've got it wrong, well, then it gives them something to help them get it right. If you've got it right, well, then it tries to move the learner forward because um, that's what feedback should do. Um, and then in terms of with that final piece, um, there we go. So in terms of the written piece at the end, if it's teacher marks, I'll talk through that in a minute. If it's peer assessed, this is this is built into the medium term plan to take the pressure off the teacher. You can't mark every single piece of work. Like, absolutely not. You can't mark every single piece of work. So, so what we try to build in is a really meaningful bit of peer assessment so the students will have the success criteria taken from the knowledge and concepts at the top of the sentence builders and then they'll go through the work and underline and label everything where, where they've met that work and then they will have a sheet similar to this where they'll tick it off they'll give them a target and then they'll give it the back and, and, and they will respond to it um, now, the, the biggest change that we're, we're, we're still grappling with and we're still um, still got teething problems around is, is around lesson seven. So what we've decided is if there's been a teacher mark, this is where we're going to build it in our feedback. If there hasn't been a teacher mark, it's been a peer assessed. This is where we look at the culture slash fluency. So our feedback lessons um, look like this. So the, this is the feedback that that and um, this is the feedback that students get now. Again, in terms of constantly reflecting, you know, be, being able to be, you know, critical and kind of to kind of think about how you can improve things. 
last year we only gave them one feedback sheet but we were doing far too much work than what's on here now and this has simplified the process loads and loads and loads so on the left hand side is and the end of that lesson we'll print that in green we'll get students to stick it in and all i'll do as a teacher is i'll tick through the strengths and i'll highlight a target and then i'll give it them back we translate the phrase they use it and then they translate how they've used it with the other sheet i'm making notes as a mark in my books so just in terms of what grammar errors can i see and what spellings can i see and as a class, we fix them in that we fix them in that feedback lesson. So they have personal individualized feedback, but then you've also got a point to pause and to reteach where, where, where you need to. Um, and then with regards to um, my, my starter, I plan my whole class feedback first, and then my retrieval task at the beginning links into that. So this is where, like I say, in terms of that transfer retrieval we were talking about before, you know, it's it, it, it's just to kind of start to sort of sow the seed for actually later on. Well, you have you know to just just kind of give them a little bit in, in terms of support to help them correct those errors then with lesson then if they're not if we're not doing feedback well then we're going to look at culture slash fluency so how this is how this looks is sort of built into an authentic list in a meeting and then looking at fluency training on right on the on writing and speaking this is very much still a work in progress for us but this is kind of this is the road that we're going down at the minute so how what we're starting to do, we were really fortunate towards the end of last year um that we had a pgc student complete their enrichment placement with us so what i did is i gave them a list of our core sentence builders and i said right what i want you to do is find me a listening task that uses most of this language or find me a reading that uses most of this language so whether it's a song whether it's a poem whether it's a story whether it's whatever find me something with that and then what i've done is i've given one member of our team um given those resources and then they've gone away to plan activities around that with the appropriate scaffold for them and um, so there's a million things you could do with, with with that on there but as i say we're years down the line in terms of this journey and constantly tweaking constantly tweaking so if you're just starting now this is maybe year two year three you know a few years down a few years down the line and um, and then with regards to the fluency training well fluency is really where we're looking at the ability to to respond and convey meaning you know quickly quickly that, that that's kind of that's kind of what we're looking at and also you know is, is very much context specific just because students are fluent with one sentence builder and one skill doesn't mean they're fluent in all the skills doesn't mean with that sentence builder doesn't mean they're fluent with every sentence builder that you're ever going to give them and um, so making sure that language is highly familiar is absolutely important here and building that into medium term plan where it's like we've done now where we're going to get it in every seven lessons and then a section at the end of the term where, where we're going to look at it um but like i said these tasks can be really similar to what you've done before but now the focus is on speed and focusing on speed with that highly highly familiar language and then oh, out. thanks for staying with me i've just noticed the time but um the last last little um is just the, the proofs in the pudding one of the main questions I get asked with this and when i've to other schools of it as well is does it work yeah, absolutely works. You know, the, the, this is a kid from last year. Um, this is a kid from last year. I think they did. This was around whenever after Christmas at some point. They'd never done Spanish before they came to us. And this is what they produced on their own. Um, of course, there are errors in there. It's year seven. It's not really perfect. But they, this is the point I'm making. Like, they have apps, you know, the students are happier. The students are more confident. The students feel more successful, which if you look at anything to do with motivation is the key regardless of anything else students need to feel that they can be successful you're successful you're motivated that's every motivation theory leads back leads back to that but also my staff are happy because my staff are really well supported they're really well supported in terms of the scaffold like 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 in terms of the scaffolds that we give to the children we're giving scaffolds and worked examples to, to staff to staff too so the um the proof is absolutely in putting there that it it it, it, it really does work um so all I can say, really, just to finish things off, is um, is well, thank you, thank you very much for listening. And um, got a couple of questions on Q and A that I'll, that I'll answer now. Um, and if anyone thinks of anything else, um, please feel free to put it in there. I'm I'm happy to hang around until all the questions are done. Um, also, uh, you know, please add me on Twitter if you've got any questions. You can send me on there. My work emails on there. Um, if you want to come for a visit. And you can get yourself to manchester then absolutely come come, come and visit us um let me just have a look at terms of 
terms of just a few things on the Q&A. So we've got, how easy do you find it to set cover work that fits in your lesson cycle? Um, I think what we try to do, because again, it depends on, it, it, you know, it depends on your school, it depends on in terms of attitudes when, when they've got a cover teacher, is what, what I'll try and do is I'll try and leave the lesson, but make it bulletproof for a non-specialist. So the modeling lessons, the modeling lessons are a little bit harder to do with that. But, you know, it might be a case of in terms of, you know, the reading where, where I've got listening tasks, they all of a sudden become a reading task or you know, it's just about trying to ha ha how, how to adapt it. That's what we found in terms of the easiest way. Um, we have tried using sort of old national stuff as well, but because our curriculum is bespoke, it is difficult to find to find stuff. Um, so that's kind of how how we how we adapt it. So I hope that answers your question, Ashley. Um, and Nia's asked, do you still use tech, GCSE textbooks? Um, maybe I'll come back next year um, and talk about what we're doing with um, GCSE because we're trying something. We're trying um, a similar approach, but a bit faster because they've had that foundation already at Key Stage 3. Um, and also we're going at you know, we've got a lot of stuff to cover in Key Stage 3. Um, so what I've started to do is sort of a mini free lesson cycle is where we'll look at similar looking at phonics and form, like meaning and form of chunks, but a little bit of structured output in that first lesson. Then lesson two, very similar to what we already do at Key Stage 3, listening, reading, flooded input with a hinge question in there. And then lesson three, the last one that I've seen them in the week, so then that's when we focus on the output. So we have a bit of like the konayuda, sinayuda, like we saw before. Um, I've made a few sentence builders. Um, I've made a few sentence builders based on the GCSE textbook, but it's like with everything, it's 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 a work in progress at the minute. Um, so maybe so maybe we'll come back next year and talk about that one. So I hope that answers your question, Mia. Um, and then Claire's asked, just wondering, do you use specific homework tasks to support this lesson structure? Um, so with regards to our school, um, we have a centralised homework policy. Um, so the students are given a booklet every week. So I need to plan so many tasks. I need to plan so many tasks for, for each half term. And then that's then put together within a booklet. Um, I think if, 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 if we didn't have a booklet, if we didn't have that, and it was just based on a class teacher, I probably what, what I would do is would just be in terms of set homework based on just more of the same of what of, of what they've done now obviously with listening that's quite challenging but you know I, I would I, 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 with any sort of homework it should kind of be sort of a continuation of what they've been doing and help support help support them that further down the line so I'm sorry that's probably not the answer you're after but again like I said at the start it's it's all about all that context um so a couple of things in the chat, Sammy, I've started to stalk you on Twitter. All right, thanks, Elena. Um, and then that's about that. Susie asked about sharing a PowerPoint. Um, I'm not too sure how that's how it works with the PowerPoint. I know, I know. It's like if you if you send me an email or send me a message on Twitter, then I can I can absolutely I can absolutely share the PowerPoint. Um, right then. Well, if that is that for everyone. All right, great. Um, if if that is that, well, thank you very much, everyone, for um, thank you very much for listening. Cheers. See you later. Oh, come on. So, cheers. <laughs>